Welcome to End Time Seminars, and we'll get started here. We'll jump right in. Uh, just to review what End Time Seminars is all about, we discuss uh, current events in the light of biblical prophecy in order to understand what time it is. Uh, we're expanding our worldview in order to become more compassionate and Christ-like, and we are applying that knowledge for practical uses. A little bit of an overview tonight. We're going to talk about Bible prophecy in the news. We're going to discuss the two-state solution with Israel and Palestine. We're going to expand our worldview with a little more hermetic philosophy that we started uh, last week. We're going to go over two more of those uh, principles of hermetic philosophy tonight. And uh, for those of you watching, if you weren't here last week, uh, you might want to go back and watch the first session and get the first three uh, axioms of hermetic philosophy because we're going to do uh, two more tonight. Knowledge is power. We're going to see how we can apply the things that we're learning uh, to, uh, about expanding our worldview so that they, where the rubber meets the road. So, Bible prophecy in the news. Last week we talked about Syria, and I found a video that I wanted us to watch uh, on what's happening in Syria. So we're going to go ahead and watch that. The U.S. government continues to debate whether or not to arm the rebels in Syria even as a new poll shows nearly 80% of Americans are saying don't do it. So why are 300 Marines now stationed along the Syrian border with Jordan? The first step in full disclosure is to inform. The U.S. has located 300 Marines in northern Jordan near the border with Syria along with the Patriot anti-aircraft missile system. That report from the Times of London. The U.S. military says they're only there as part of a military training exercise. Other than that, we know very little about the role of those Marines other than the fact that they will remain there for at least several months. So the big question, how long before the United States is involved in Syria? The answer, we already are. Last year, when I talked one-on-one -on -one with President Obama, he told me the United States is careful not to provide arms to these rebel groups. The president said that in response to a question I asked him about how the United States could support the Syrian rebels when so many of those so-called rebels aren't Syrian and many are Al-Qaeda fighters from Iraq. The reality here, the United States has already provided millions in financial help to the FSA or the Free Syrian Army. We've also provided non-lethal assistance to the FSA, satellite radios as well as body armor. But according to some, like Republican Senator John McCain, that's not enough. On Memorial Day, McCain made a secret trip to Syria to meet with the leader of the Supreme Military Council of the Free Syrian Army, General Salim Idrias. Senator McCain was asked for the U.S. to take the lead in a, quote, more serious manner, end quote, more specifically to provide heavy weapons directly to the FSA. He was asked for the U.S. to create a no-fly zone for Syrian warplanes and for the strategic bombings by the U.S. to take place on the Syrian government. So what's the problem here? Well, there is, in fact, an enormous problem. This is the part of the story that so much of the media is just not telling you. The war in Syria is not a true civil war. Two years ago, President Bashar al-Assad was fairly unpopular with his people. And people who I have talked to living in Syria today tell me there was justified and growing anger against Assad. Two years ago, when civil unrest started, it looked as if there would be a push for freedom. But in short time, the people fighting that war against the government became not Syrian citizens, but jihadists and al-Qaeda fighters. You see, there are multiple groups fighting to overthrow the Assad regime. The FSA, or the Free Syrian Army, well, they are the ones making the request for help from the U.S. They're the second largest group. But the largest group, al-Nusra Front. Who's that? Al-Nusra Front is the Syrian wing of al-Qaeda in Iraq. In December of 2012, the United States officially designated al-Nusra Front as a terror organization. Then in April of this year, 2013, the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq released an audio recording announcing al-Nusra Front as its branch in Syria. Ohio Congressman Brad Winstrup tells me that much of what he knows about the situation in Syria is classified, but admits, quote, you really have to take a close look at who are your friends and what this will do to us in the long term. We have had some lessons learned on that in the past. So Congressman Winstrup can't get into too many details about what he knows, but there is a lot out there that is not classified about al-Nusra Front. About a month ago, the UK Guardian reported that the best financed, best equipped, 
and best motivated force taking on the Syrian government is not the FSA, but al-Nusra. What's more, the Free Syrian Army is losing thousands of fighters and capabilities to al-Nusra. So if these guys are so bad, why are we hearing more about it? Well, I can't tell you that, but what I can tell you is what is happening in Syria today should have the attention of every American, and evidence of it is not hard to find. All over YouTube are videos posted by members of the Free Syrian Army or al-Nusra Front demonstrating what they are doing now and what they will do in Syria once they have control. Beheadings of anyone seen as a traitor or siding with the government and the slaughtering of many innocent people. And there is something else about the situation in Syria that American media is not telling you. Until this war started two years ago, Syria was one of the few places in the Middle East where Christians, Shiite Muslims, Sunni Muslims, Alawites, and Jews all lived in peace with each other. Al-Nusra is working to end that. I want you to watch for a minute here this YouTube video of members of Al-Nusra after they've taken a Syrian town. The video here uploaded by Syrian Rebel Watch. There is translation of the words this child is singing at the bottom of the screen. And those kinds of videos are hidden in plain sight all over the internet. But the American people either don't know they're there or don't care. What you need to know is that what is happening in Syria is an enormous problem for the United States. Al-Assad may be a poor leader, but at least he allowed the people in Syria, regardless of their religious beliefs, to live at peace. Al-Qaeda in Iraq has publicly stated that their goal is to create an Al-Qaeda super state comprised of Iraq and Syria. By funding these so-called rebels, the U.S. government is handing al-Qaeda the keys to that superstate. By the United States supporting the overthrow of Assad, without question, we will hand Syria over to al-Qaeda, make no mistake. And the slaughter of millions of Syrians, including Syrian Christians, Jews, Alawites, and Muslims, will be on our hands. And that is full disclosure. But now that you've been informed, head over to binswan.com. There we have resources for you about Al Nusra Front and links to the full YouTube video that we showed you here, as well as others. It demonstrates exactly what's happening in Syria. Get engaged right now at binswan.com. Well, I hope you enjoyed that show and found it to be educational and inform Okay, so you can go to their website if you want more information about that. But the reason that I brought up that is because we talked about Syria last week and the specifically the Bible prophecy Isaiah 17 1 that says Damascus will be a heap of ruins and since Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world we haven't seen that fulfillment yet so we might be seeing it soon uh, and also with if Al-Qaeda gets control of Syria uh, and the other regions that they're trying to um, that goes into the Psalm 83 prophecy that we're gonna look at again so, we're going to come full circle on that. We're going to talk about the two-state solution for Israel. Uh, there's Jerusalem, and that's the Dome of the Rock, right in the middle of Jerusalem. Um, oops, let me go to my slideshow here, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, the two-state solution, they're talking about, um, when they talk about a two-state solution, that is for the Palestinians to have a legitimate country of their own within the same geographical area as Israel because uh, the Jews called the land Israel and the Palestinians called the land Palestine and uh, and before 1948 when at the end of World War II Israel was created for the Jews uh, before that um, it was just Palestine and, and you know the Palestinians live there. So it's kind of a, if you look at it one way, it's kind of a um, American Indians situation, you know, we moved in and we kind of displaced them. 
So, you know, they're rightfully upset. Um, but the problem is, they don't want to live in peace. They don't want to coexist. They want all of the Jews dead. So that's the problem. So, of course, um, here's some overseas newspapers. Here's an a Israeli newspaper uh, that says a two-state solution is still possible for Israel and the Palestinians because there was some talk about whether or not they were going to pursue it. Uh, that was just uh, this past Wednesday. Um, you can tell it's a Jewish newspaper because not only do they have June 26, 2013, <laughs> but since you know the Jews do not recognize Christ as the Messiah, obviously their year is 5773. So that's the that's the date uh, there on the Hebrew calendar. And discussion about a one-state solution in Palestine, Israel is moving to the mainstream, and a majority of both Israelis and Palestinians actually want a two-state solution. That was uh, from the Middle East Monitor uh, this week as well. So. If Israel allowed the Palestinians to have their own state, such a state would be equivalent to allowing a bitter enemy to perpetually wield a knife just inches from your heart. Richard Nixon said that uh, way back in his day. Um, but it's true. I mean, you know, they, they're not interested in living in peace with them. There is a voice of reason within uh, the Israeli government. Senior Israeli official renews his opposition to the Palestinian state. And this was just this past Tuesday. A member of Israel's ruling coalition has claimed that a peace agreement will lead to bloodshed. Israeli media reported Naftali Bennett's comments on Tuesday as the leader of the Jewish Home Party expressed his opposition to the Palestinian state yet again. He's been very, very vocal in saying that this is a very bad idea. Does the Bible say anything about the two-state solution? Well, you have to figure out uh, what the Palestinians are called in the Bible. Who are the Palestinians, and what name does the Bible use for them? Abraham was the patriarch of the Jews and Arabs. He had two sons, Ishmael, who was his firstborn from the uh, uh, Sarah's slave girl, Hagar, the Egyptian. So, um, you know, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. There are going to be uh, descendants as many as the sand on the seashore, uh, make you a father of nations. And... Uh, him and Sarah didn't believe that at first, and then, you know, of course, Sarah said, well, you know, God must mean that you can sleep with Hagar, which, you know, bad idea caused a lot of problems to this very, very day. Uh, but Ishmael was his firstborn, and then after that, uh, which they were not living in harmony after that, uh, Sarah actually had Isaac, and Isaac was the son uh, of the promise. He was the miracle son uh, that God would uh, bring Jesus to save the world through. But... The Arabs believe that Abraham almost sacrificed Ishmael on, uh, when, when God tested him. And that happened allegedly where the Dome of the Rock is. That rock was where Abraham was going to sacrifice Ishmael. And uh, so that's, that's their version of it. And then, of course, the, the Jews believe that it was Isaac uh, because he was the, the miracle baby because Sarah was very, very old and well past the age of having children. So then you have Isaac, and he has two sons. They're twins, Esau and Jacob. And Esau was born first, and then Jacob right afterwards. And when Esau was born, Jacob was born with his fist wrapped around Esau's uh, ankle as a sign that he was going to usurp. And uh, Jacob means uh, usurper. And he cheated Esau out of his birthright. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and his children are the Jews. Esau was sometimes called Edom, and he's the father of the Edomites, and those are the Palestinians. So the Palestinians are the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. So here we have cousins fighting. That's the Jews and the Palestinians. They're, they're fighting cousins, so to speak. And then the rest of the Arabs came from Ishmael. So that to, to set the stage for who's fighting who now. So what does the Bible say about Edom? Isaiah 34, 11 and 12, and he, God, will stretch over it, Edom, a measuring line of confusion, and the plummet stones of chaos. Those are contractor terms, measuring line, plumb bob. So he's going to stretch out a measuring line of confusion and the plummet stones of chaos over its nobles. They shall call its nobles to proclaim the kingdom, but nothing shall be there. In other words, the UN shall call the delegates to proclaim the country of Palestine, but nothing shall be there. That's the prophecy for Edom. So the Bible says that the land of the descendants of Esau will be proclaimed a kingdom, 
but the kingdom will never really manifest. So all this talk of a two-state solution isn't really going to come to fruition for Palestine to really, really be a country. And it's a good thing, because if they were really a legitimate country, then they would be have the privileges of all of the other countries, such as all of these weapons and things to, to protect themselves, and guess what they would use them on? Their cousin Jacob. So we can't have Palestine becoming a legitimate country, because as Nixon said, it would be like having somebody just holding a knife to your throat the whole time. So that's what the Bible says about the two-state solution. If a Palestinian state is proclaimed with, with Israel's enemies surrounding her, Will the Psalm 83 coalition begin to fall into place? We talked about Psalm 83 last week. Come, they say, and let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of her existence. This was their unanimous decision at their summit conference. They signed a treaty to ally themselves against Almighty God. Oh, my God, blow them away like dust, like chaff before the wind, as a forest fire that roars across a mountain. It sounds like a terrible, terrible war, a forest fire that roars across a mountain. It's not going to end well for the Palestinians. Uh, and for all of those that come together with them to come against Israel. And we're seeing that now with the Syrians, because the money that we're sending to the free Syrian army is really going to Al-Qaeda, al what was the al Nestra, yes, uh, the Al-Qaeda force within Syria. So, and they are, they have their operatives in Iraq, and the whole region, is going to come against Israel and it's going to end up being the Psalm 83 war. So that's what's coming up. Come, they say, and let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of her existence. That's what they want. Who are they? The descendants of Ishmael, son of Abraham and Hagar, and the descendants of Esau, Edom, the father of the Edomites, the present-day Palestinians. So the Palestinians and all those other Arab countries that are hostile, like the Syrians, are going to all come together and cause that Psalm 83 war. And we're seeing that come together now. So watch this development closely because the announcement of the Palestinian state could very well be the precursor to that Psalm 83 war. So we'll watch because if they're going to announce it. When you hear the proclamation of the Palestinian state, know that the Bible prophecy has been fulfilled and know that nothing will come of it and know that the final annihilating war of the House of Edom, the Palestinians, is close at hand. So... They shall call its nobles to proclaim the kingdom, but nothing shall be there. The UN will say, there's the Palestinian state, but it's never going to come to fruition. Okay, that was part one.